Oh, Currently, man. Tarfia is the is it the Del Banco, the Andrew Del Banco visiting professor? Nicholas Del Banco. There's a few Del Bancos. The Nicholas Del Banco visiting professor. Uh, at the University of Michigan, where she teaches poetry, and uh, currently lives in Detroit, and has come all the way to uh, Connecticut to be with us here today to read from her beautiful first book, Scene, and also to read some new poems, which she has just written. She met with my intro poetry class this morning. Great discussion that we had about race, identity, comic books, video games, all kinds of stuff. Uh, if you haven't read her first book, as my poetry students have done, you should definitely try to pick up a copy and read it. It's, a, it's an incredibly intense book uh, based upon some of the experiences she had on a Fulbright Fellowship in Bangladesh, where she uh, was living in for a year, uh, interviewing many of the rape victims uh, from the 1971 uh, War for Independence, uh, at the time East Pakistan, in a war with West Pakistan, and then East Pakistan became Bangladesh. Um, Apparently over 200,000 women were raped during this war. She interviewed many of them and uh, wrote about some of their experiences, also wrote about uh, her own experiences, interviewing them, the feelings that she had about that, and so on and so forth. So as I remember Tim <laughs> promoted the reading at his reading, it's a very dark book, but also a very compelling book. I think one of the most important books uh, published this, this year, right? Or was it last year? This year. Yeah, you're looking at me like, why doesn't he know this already? No, I was just kind of, I was like, was it this year? Yeah, this year. Uh, it's a really fantastic, very important book. Uh, she's going to read from it. A little background, she was born in Brooklyn, which I love, of course, where I live, as many of you make fun of me for doing. Commuting here, she came with me on the Hutchinson today. There was a huge accident, so we got here late. Good times. Raised in West Texas. Um, got an MFA at Virginia Commonwealth and has won many fellowships, probably too many to name, but some of the highlights, uh, she's a Kuhneman Fellow, she also won a Fulbright Fellowship, as I said, and has been a scholar at the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, the Siwani Writers Conference, and the Kenyan Review Writers Workshop as well. Uh, a very decorated young poet, also very exciting poet, uh, very well-dressed poet, <laughs> good hair, all of that good stuff, so please give a warm, clean hand welcome to Um, I'm going to be reading, as Jason said, some new poems and some um, poems from Scene. Um, but I just wanted to take a second and thank you all so much for being here. Um, as the comedian John Mulaney says, it is easier, about 100% easier to do nothing than it is to do anything. So thank you for being here. <clears throat> I told the water, I told the water, you're right. The dead are broken sidewalks that we try to avoid. Told it, the map of you folds into corners small enough to swallow. I told the water, you only exist because of thirst. Beside your glistening membrane, I lie face down in dirt. The first time my father threw me into you, I was hieroglyph, a wet braid caught in your throat. I knew then how war was possible, the urge to defy gravity, the urge to disarm another. I knew then I would live to be your mirror. You, graveyard of windows, you, black-eyed barnacle. I told the water last night I walked out onto the ice wearing only my skin because you did not tell me not to. The Hidden Register of Violence. Slavery remembers dreaming he cut off the head of the soldier beside him. He thought he knew better, thought he understood suspicion, but sometimes light on water is treated like the Holy Ghost when it's just some wave particle residue. I could love jealousy if he'd show up in a better tailored suit or didn't ask me if I had another 10 seconds to chat. Tonight, rage is a god entering my body from behind, while the sky is a lush calyx I set on fire just to watch it bloom. Today, I'll try, I'll try not to say his brother's name, War, but screw it, because he doesn't deserve the wind carrying his vicious music to the orphans. I should love you more, 
What bitterness do I have to tell you? Show me the softest part of your throat. I still want what's yours, because every day, sorrow shows up and turns all of my teeth into tasers. Um, today in um, Jason's class, we were talking about loss and memory and, and history, and one of the things we talked about was um, sort of these different losses outside of the, the ones that um, I researched in Bangladesh. Um, so I wanted to read these three poems that are about the women, but also um, about losing my sister at a very young age. <clears throat> Interview with the Brombana. Do you have siblings? Where were they? On a thin lavender evening like this one, we sisters sat and waited until we were only listening for them to come. We became these four walls, corrugated, twilight. On a thin lavender evening like this one, we were each other's world entire, both the wood rose as well as its tangled stem. When they came for us, on a thin lavender evening like this one, we tried to pull each other out of their rifle black hands. We tried to scream through fingers ripe with our own rivers. On a thin lavender evening like this one, she was not yet the ripped bandage. The night turned into the crimson moon under which I did not know I would stumble gasping alone. We had held each other's hands, but we didn't promise not to let go. Interviewer's note. But wasn't it the neat narrative you wanted? The outline of the rape victim standing against a many-winged darkening sky, shadow flurrying across shadow? They tossed me into that river, but the river wouldn't kill me, she said yesterday. You want to be the darkness she stood against, to be yards of violet velvet. Your mother once cut into dresses for you and your sister when she was still alive. Rewind, play, rewind. They tossed me, river, me. You want the splayed heart of another's hand clasping yours. You want to know if cruelty exists or if it is only love's threadbare desperation. River, me, river, me, me. The interviewer acknowledges grief. Sister, I waste time. I play and replay the voices of these hurt women flowering like marigolds or thistles. Something lost, forgotten. That picture of you, violin sewn fast to your shoulder, bow in one hand poised eternal. Again, the power's gone out. Tell me, what is it to say I miss you? Because you won't grow breasts, never feel desire rippling across you like bolts of silk, these many lied men unshelf daily from my choosing. Because you can't reassure me I have the right to ask anything of women whose bodies won't ever again be their own. You can't blot away this utter sooted darkness. You don't hesitate when another war heroine asks you, do you have any siblings? For decades, you've been so small, a child tapping on opaque windows. Now, through the veranda's black iron bars, I see you, dark silhouette hurrying past, a bagged red box dangling from one slender arm, gift for a lover or a mother. Again, the generator shudders me back into light. Isn't this, sister, what I always said I wanted? Self-portrait as Slinky. Mm -hmm. It's true I wanted to be beautiful before authentic. Say the word exotic. Say minority. A coiled dark curl a finger might wrap itself in. The long staircase and I was the momentum of metal springs descending down <coughs> and down. Say tension. 
the long staircase, and I was a stacked series of spears fingertipped again into motion. Say taught, like a child who must please her parents, but doesn't know how. A curl pulled thin. I wanted to be a reckoning, to gather into each day's pale hands, that helpless lotion forward in the dark, another soaked black ringlet, that sudden halting. Yeah. <laughs> Since, uh, <coughs> Blossoms in the dark. If only love could be like that first slice of bacon dissolving on your tongue. <laughs> or the short, tight skirt rolled into your purse nights you salaamed your parents goodbye to arrive at the party bare-legged, redolent of cigarettes kissed with lips reddened hastily in the dark, is love your father's silk tie you've learned to let dangle between your bare breasts? Is there faith woven into the skullcap he unfolds each dawn, noon, and twilight? Or is it in his neat, shorn nails, scratching skin off the back of his sun-black neck? Today, you ask the Muslim at the deli to please slice the ham, paper thin. Is it faith whose hand holds back your hair while you're sick beside the keg, your skirt riding up? Tomorrow, you'll love any man willing to fling his tongue into that valley above your collarbone. No one can tell you what to do with your breath braiding his throat. No one can tell you what to do with your fingers. Mother will call twice while you've got one hand on his cock, and you'll consider picking up. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about love poems lately. I totally did pick a fight with my really wonderful um, boyfriend last night. But, um, so I'm, I'm gonna read this now in the hopes that somewhere in, in the city, wherever he is, he's, he's on his way to forgiving me. Um, love poem ending with the eye of a needle. Sure, I know I summoned you away from me, but don't you know that I'm heavy with your leaving? a single branch swaying from another finch alighting. Every night, my spine dreams a child into the side that tames my torso so it won't unravel towards you. But please, love, tell me again that water is a pattern interrupted by my unbuttoned body, even if I don't tell you the shape I made once, arching beneath the drape of his panting. A taut ripping so natural, I wonder if there's a placket in me large enough to pocket the thought of you. I wanted to pleat your fingers slight bending when they hovered over my knee. You parked the car, reached toward me to flick another suicide bombing off the radio. It fucks with me, the binding of love between two people who have always loved each other and always will. The severed distance between us, this far apart, width of the widest river or narrowest blade of grass, length of the strand of thread my mother taught me to first bite free with your teeth, then wet with your tongue to struggle through the thin eye of any needle. like to grow up in West Texas as a brown girl. <clears throat> Self-portrait as mango. She says, your English is great. How long have you been in our country? And I say, suck on a mango, bitch. <laughs> Since that's all you think I eat anyway. Mangoes are what model minorities like me are supposed to know nothing about. Doesn't a mango just win spelling bees and kiss white boys? Isn't a mango a placeholder in a poem folded with saris? But this one, the one I'm going to shove down her throat, is a mango that remembers jungles jagged with insects, 
the river's darker thirst. This mango was cut down by a scythe that beheaded soldiers, a mango that taunts and suns itself into a hard compost <coughs> only a few months a year, fattens while blood stains green ponds. Why use a mango to beat her to death, you might ask. Why not a coconut, after all? Because this exotic fruit won't be cracked open to reveal to you its own whiteness. This mango is an alien merely because of a bone-hard brown shell. I know I'm worth waiting for. I want to be needed for ripeness. Mango, my own sunset-skinned heart waiting to be held and peeled. Mango, Amu taught me to cut open with my teeth. Tarfia, she would say. This is the only way to eat a mango. Just have a couple more poems. I heard a poet recently talk about how all poets, for some reason, give the audience a two-poem warning. And it's, it's actually quite true. I don't know why we do it. So this is um, because Halloween was just, just a little while ago. What I want unlocks itself. At the Halloween party, the vampire congratulates me on my corset as though I've been promoted or had a child. <laughs> it prickles like cold water dawns. I loved turning a coin in the sky between my fingers. A zombie knocks past the punch bowl. Don't flinch. Put your arm around him. It's, e it's easy to thistle the air into fortune with a lit cigarette harder to lean into the werewolf who begs me to unzip him. In the drawer I never left open at home are the blades of scissors pressed together, like the thighs of the drunk dinosaur passed out across the stairs. The one who reached past me into the bowl of eyeballs and laughed, I mean, if you can't screw in paradise, where can you? It's easy to not think about how my father might feel if he saw how I snip gardens of plums out of my clothes and lacerate my inner thighs. An astronaut cups my ass as we dance. The drunk dinosaur wakes, roars. What I want locks itself into the same old muzzle, passes again into the mosque on Midland Drive beside Mrs. Baird's. It was there that I first learned the word shame could rise with a shape and a taste, and a scent. <coughs> so this is your, this is your official two poem, two poem one. <coughs> this is called 100 Bells, and I wrote this um, after reading a really astonishly, astonishing poem by um, a wonderful poet named Vibe Francis. Um, and the name of the poem is called Say It, Say It. Her poem is Say It, Say It Any Way You Can. This is 100 Bells. My sister died. He raped me. They beat me. I fell to the floor. I didn't. I knew children, their smallness, her corpse, my fingernails, the softness of my belly, how it could double over. It was puckered, like children, ugly when we cry. My sister died and was revived. Her brain burst into blood. Father was driving. He fell asleep. They beat me. I didn't flinch. I did. It was the only dance I knew. It was the kathak. My ankles sang with 100 bells. The stranger raped me on the fitted sheet. I didn't scream. I did not know better. I knew better. I did not live. My father said, I will go to jail tonight because I will kill you. I said, but she died. It was the Katakali. Only men were allowed to dance it. I threw a chair at my mother. I ran from her. The kitchen. The fly swatter was a whip. The fly swatter was a fly swatter. I was thrown into a fire ant bed. I wanted to be a man. It was summer in Texas and dry. I burned. It was a snake dance. He said, now I've seen a Muslim girl naked. I held him to my chest. I held her because I didn't know it would be the last time. I threw no punches. I threw a glass box into a wall. Somebody is always singing. Songs were not allowed. Mother said, dance, and the bells will sing with you. I slithered, glass beneath my feet. I locked the door. I did not die. I shaved my head until the horns I knew were there were visible until the doorknob went silent. Wow.
close with the last poem, I guess second to last poem from Scene. Um, thanks again so much for being here and for, for listening. Um, I think, you know, it's so amazing to me that there are these articles that are published every year and, I don't know, and really what you would think of as top-notch places like Atlantic Monthly and the New Yorker that are like, does poetry matter anymore? <laughs> and, you know, it's just, you know, it's ridiculous because it's a yes or no question. So, thanks again for being here and making sure that's not true. Um, en route to Bangladesh, another crisis of faith. We pass over heavy shadows of large clouds pinned to train cars, lined up like unused blocks of colored chalk, red then green, blue then orange, until we're propelled higher and the trains are swallowed by these jagged strictures of land that are no longer sand, nor rock, nor water, but a child's drawing instead until the distant ocean is the only fabric that fills this punched out plastic hole of a window, that is the blue <coughs> that falls over everything, that is everything, blue on blue on blue, like the one seam of white left always on the airplane ceiling that the pale plastic shades cannot shut away, until that narrow vein of light is the only belief left, a cream thick ribbon across our eyes. So we have uh, some time for questions. I'd like to ask Chucky about anything from poetry to video games. <laughs> oh, where'd I get these boots? Um, I got them in a small boutique in Champaign, Illinois. And um, I actually have, like, I was, I was admiring those. I have, a, I, have a, I have an almost Imelda. I'm from Texas, so I was like... I was born in Texas, too. Yeah. Um, I have an almost Imelda Marcus like <laughs> level of passion for boots. I wish I could say this is a, one of the only pair of boots that I own from last year ago, but I got them from a little boutique in Champaign, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, right, so poems like you, you, you really thread and include class, like I kind of got a sense they were, were relating to the speakers to to the speaker's own sexuality and feelings of of guilt and other emotions while interviewing interview, interviewing women who are raped like yeah. hmm. <laughs> like I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean I can I can say some things about that. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is that conversation that's happening there um, about, you know, I guess I'll say her, um, because it's like a different version of me. But I, I think she is struggling with her sexuality and trying to understand how it's in conversation with what has happened to her as well as what has happened to these women. Um, yeah, and, and I think like, you know, I mean, I think we all sort of spend years sort of wrestling with these ideas of morality or, um, you know, modesty or shame or um, desire or longing and all of these things. And so I felt like, for me, it would be dishonest if I excluded those things from the conversation. Yeah. Um, I know you're inspired a lot by real life events or, or events that happened around your life. Um, are there, what are some other inspirations that you draw from, like music or, or art or anything like that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like I, I do draw <coughs> from my own life, but um, lately I've been kind of interested in writing things that are just about this current moment and kind of noticing the world around me. Um, I have a couple of poems, I didn't read them today, but um, that have drones in them, for example. Um, and so I'm, I'm always kind of interested in whatever kind of conversation is happening between the interior and the exterior, um, whatever materials are there at the time, um, whether it's you know what's happening um, in the Middle East or what's happening down the street for me or what's happening in my own life. What kind of music are you into? What kind of music am I into? 
Oh God, I love everything. I know everyone says that, but I really do like everything from musical theater to really hard rap to, um, I'm trying to let me think of some people who I've never Nick Cave. Like to Nick Cave. I love Nick Cave. We're, we're gushing over Nick Cave today. Um, on heavy rotation right now, I have Big Boy, Santa Gold, uh, Nick Cave, um, Mozart, <laughs> and um, who have I been listening to? Um, Towns Van Sant, Johnny Cash, and um, Bone Thugs and Harmony. Speaking of Ohio. Nice. <laughs> how has um, how has film uh, influenced your sense of and your sense of the capture of the line? You know, outside of just as a method. I mean you get into your content from sexual politics to identity politics, right. which is Kinds of films. I, mean, I suppose it's the same question as what kind of films influence you, but yeah. specifically how films inform your, your method. Yeah. Um, I guess I think of all of these different genres as different formats in which there are certain vocabularies um, and tendencies that these different formats have. So I feel like I'm influenced by format in general, I would say. Um, whether that's, you know, like, I mean, I feel like sometimes, like, I'm as influenced by Twitter as I am by, say, um, you know, like Sethi Jethroy, who's a very famous Bengali filmmaker, and um, did these really, some of them are really imaginative, um, you know, movies um, about rural life in Bangladesh. So I would say I'm influenced by the, the format of thinking about a frame, you know, and sort of like what the lens can do and where the lens can go, and what you're choosing to look at, and whether you're looking at something off to the side, or if you're sort of panning slowly away from something, you know, um, and fading to black. So I would say that, um, you know, the same thing we were talking about comic books, like I feel like they're, they're framed, they're, I feel like what format, what film teaches me about um, is, is framing, and um, where to look and how to look, and, and what to do with the light, I think too, where the light falls, um, and what you can see in the light and how our eyes are just to dark things too. Thank you. Speaking of film, you know, um, I was wondering what, you know, especially after some of the conversations we had, and uh, something we didn't get into that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, what did you think of the, the video of the woman walking around New York City? Did you see that video, the Kent Calling video? I heard, I saw it in my peripheral <coughs> vision, okay. but so I haven't seen it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. <laughs> I mean, I think it's... You guys know what video I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. It's like millions of hits already. Yeah. So what happens in the video, in the, terms of what my understanding the problem, is... The problems that were raised about it. Right. Yeah. Um, what were some of the problems raised? I remember People like that. Roxane Gay and others complained that all the men were men of color, and mm -hmm. they didn't show white men doing the cat drawing, and so the issues there... <laughs> yeah. You know, like the representational issues. So there's a big controversy now about it. Yeah. It's interesting. I feel like um, part of the reason those things sometimes stay in my periphery, I kind of wait until the, the kind of chaos around it dies down and then go look at it so I can make my own opinion. Yeah. Um, I, I think in part because I, I just don't want to be influenced by the way everyone else is talking about something. Um, so what I think of it from afar is that, um, you know, like I think like there are all of these, one of the things about the internet man is that it just like creates all of this space for, you know, just like picking on people. I mean, it's just, it's just kind of amazing. It's like you're screwed if you do and you're screwed if you don't. And, you know, I think like there was a lot of, there's a lot of validity to, um, you know, the notion of like a woman trying to make a film that in some way documents her particular experience of something. And if her particular experience of something does not include white men, then how can you say that she's doing something wrong? It's interesting that Roxane Gay um, would be critical of that because she is far less critical of, say, somebody like Lena Dunham, for example, who there's all of this equal controversy around about whether or not she actually was sexually abusive to her sister, right? Um, and I've seen Roxane Gay take up for Lena Dunham in a way that, um, you know, like I think like 
you know, a lot of people have a real problem with Lena Dunham um, whitewashing a show and only depicting people of color as nanny, nannies and bellhops, you know. So I sort of feel like, you know, like I try to keep away from some of the those. And then there was this recent, I think, like kind of like a lot of women coming forward and um, making accusations about being, you know, sexually insulted or sexually violated by different prominent writers. Yeah. And um, in fact, there's a meeting in New York tonight about. It, oh, really? Huh. Which I'm avoiding. <laughs> I don't <laughs> Some blame. Some the same reasons, but they're having a enough is enough meeting. Yeah. But a lot of these things that I'm just like, what, where are these things happening? Yeah. Yeah. There's a meeting about the poultry community in New York. And I just feel like that's certain people's communities where all that shit is happening. Right. And they're all part of the wrong communities. Yeah. Um, I mean I mean I think like I could I could spend so much time getting angry if I wanted to. You know, truthfully. Like there is plenty to be pissed off about. And I'm really actively trying every day to live in these three seconds of the present and then the next three seconds and the next three seconds and to try to, you know, like, to practice as both as it sounds, to practice joy. Like, it's just so, I'm so bored by being angry and sad about so many things. Like, it doesn't do me any good. I feel like, ultimately, it takes me further away from, you know, like, focusing on how much extraordinary art there are, there is, how many amazing people there are doing real groundbreaking work that's chipping away at these issues. And I think what happens sometimes is that people focus on the controversy. Well, there are a lot of people off to the side who are really actually directly addressing the complaints, you know, of a lot of these things. So I'd rather <laughs> focus my energy there. Was that a difficult thing as you were writing this book to, to kind of remember, come back to like just the idea of joy because you're you know obviously surrounded by just darkness and <laughs> thinking about like in the present and the past and a lot of things to be angry about. Was that something you had to like, remind yourself of or try to balance in some ways? Yeah. Or, or, or was just act of writing poetry itself joyful even if you're writing dark stuff? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I basically, I feel like I live poem to poem, you know, like the awesome, like, there's awesome stuff that happens in between, but there's nothing to me like that feeling of losing yourself in the act of creating something. Um, but when I was in Bangladesh, um, and, and I think it is hard sometimes because, you know, like, um, I'm going to begin this sentence with a phrase that I really hate saying. I was talking to my therapist about this. That <laughs> you only have one? <laughs> Just right now, right now. I'm doing okay right now, so, you know, I don't know. I can you one. <laughs> Um, but I was talking to my therapist about this sort of very thing, like about how there are certainly lots of reasons I could sort of point to as reasons I feel sad. Like I probably feel sad because my parents, or because my sister, blah, blah, or there's a war happening, or, you know, Lena Dunham, or, you know, any, any of these things, just by herself. Um, I have no position on Lena Dunham, but, um, you know, like, and I, I feel like it's, it's something that I've been trying not to do because it just keeps me in the darkness for longer. Um, and when I was in Bangladesh, I was really lucky to have some friends there who I made um, who pulled me out of my tunnel vision. Cause like I would just sort of, I would go and interview the women and or, or I would do all this research, look at all these difficult kind of horrible, you know, really ex violent photographs for example. And, and then I would basically come home to the apartment I was staying in, in Dhaka, the capital, and kind of like not leave the house or shower for three days, you know? And like, cause like it was just so hard to do anything after that. And I had um, this really sweet friend named Olinda who was just like super bubbly and just kind of like relentlessly cheerful, you know? And so she would sort of like be like, no, we're getting your ass out now. Take a shower. No, seriously, I'm going to take a shower right now. And um, and we're gonna go. We're gonna go on an adventure. We're gonna go have a bite to eat. We're gonna go watch a movie. Whatever. And um, so I was really lucky to have a few people around who um, kind of like not just encouraged, but but really like you know like demanded that I put my attention elsewhere. And it was really helpful. I don't think that. I would have been able to sustain the research I was doing otherwise without those breaks that we've had. Yeah. Um, this putting your attention elsewhere and going back to your statement about the joyful immersion in making something. Um, how much of 
part of your practice is shutting off the fire hose of the web, just shutting off social media in terms of your practice. This is a sort of focus where this is it, this is the present, not a distracted one, a focused one. Or do you allow yourself to sort of be interrupted and, and you're bringing in all, all yeah. sorts of streams? Yeah. How does that work? Yes, I go back and forth. I mean, some days are definitely more distracted days. And those days are sort of more like, you know, my adult ADHD days, you know, where like I kind of like this thing on Facebook and I'll follow it to, you know, I call it um, rabbit holing. Um, you know, where like somehow you start out by reading about the Avengers on Wikipedia and then somehow you you end up reading about incest in popular culture on Wikipedia <laughs> and you're like, I don't know how I got there, but here I am. Um, so I let myself do that. You know, and that's a different kind of research or a different kind of focus, I yeah. think. And it's far more wandery, I guess. Wandery is not a word, I realize. Um, now it is. Yeah. That's the thing that's so great about being a person oh, just yeah. things up. But, um, so some days are really um, unfocused in terms of that, but I feel like a different kind of energy from that. And then other days, it's just everything gets shut off totally. Um, why? Why does everything get shut off? I think because... Um, I think because when that distraction is not, when it doesn't feel useful to me is when it's distracting me away from tapping into the vastness inside of me and the vastness outside of me. Like, you know, I'll sort of be looking at things like in these micro cosmic ways. Um, but one of the things that is so astounding about the world we live in is that it's so vast. And I feel like, for me, stories and art comes from tapping into that deep, deep, endless vastness inside of you. Like, you can, like, reach in to this, like, super long, deep, dark abyss and pull something out and wrestle it into something um, beautiful or awful or both. And so I feel like it's harder for me to tap into that vastness on days. Um, that the distraction doesn't go right, but you know, but again, sometimes that the, the wandering can lead to experiencing vastness in a very different way, which is you know these associations between seemingly disparate things, um, which I think is what the metaphor comes from too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, since what you just said, this might be a tough question to answer, since you just said we're like, trying to you know find the joy and stuff like that. Um, when you were interviewing the women in Bangladesh on, on uh, you know, the issue of rape, how did that like affect the? How did that affect your view of the issue of rape in America? Because I, I was watching this movie once, and there was this, there was this really you know, cool guy in the movie, and he said, you know, we 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 think we believe in something called morality, but we don't. We believe in something called law, and the Bill of Rights. You know, it, 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 the attempt was to make everybody seem equal, but this is a very young country, and for for centuries, it seems like the Bill of Rights has been has been a code to protect only the you know the white males of America. Since they, they we're still talking about topics that we've been talking about for years, when we have this stupid Bill of Rights, and uh, I just wanted to know, like, did you know how did how did interview with women in Bangladesh? Affect affect your view of the issue of rape in America and how we are still we're still neglecting it, even though we want to go over to other countries and save other people's women. Mm -hmm. There it is. Yeah, preach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I don't know. I got asked. Um, a very a similar but very different question recently about whether or not I hated men after I interviewed, <laughs> you know, the women in Bangladesh, and um, the answer is no, I didn't. Um, I actually saw a lot of um, support for men in Bangladesh, and I and I think that's I guess like what I have to say about it is that to me it's not divisive as much as like it gave me a kind of optimism that men can really step forward and be supportive. There are a lot of sensitive men in this country at this moment in time. You know, like, um, you know I mean, and, and there are men who believe that this is, that it's really wrong. And I mean, my partner is, is one of those men. He's, he's a real, you know, like he doesn't need to spend a lot of time decrying 
break because he knows what he would do if something happened to somebody he cared about, you know? Um, and so I feel like, like I feel like, I hear this phrase all the time now, rape culture. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what it means, you know? Like, I don't understand what it means to say that there is a culture of rape when it is so ancient and so, you know, deeply embedded in our psyches, either as victims of it, or as perpetrators of it, or as witnesses to it. Um, so I feel like, you know, these, these problems, they perpetuate themselves, and part of it is because of fear, and because of shame, and because of, you know, like, the moral standards. I mean, how many times do we see the situation where a woman comes forward and everybody's like, no, but he couldn't possibly because he's so and so and so. So there's an immediate defense of, um, of, of of somebody's personality, as though somebody's personality is what you know eventually like what keeps somebody from doing or not doing this horrible act. You know. Um, I realize that I'm not answering your question as much as I am just kind of rambling about the various issues that I see around it, but I think that's part of it too, is that I don't see it as an answerable question, but I see it as an addressable issue, you know, that can come from tribe building, come, can come from sharing these stories, um, can come from, you know, like encouraging both men and women to scrutinize the way they think about it to be introspective and thoughtful about the way we think about these issues. Um, but I don't feel like, you know, I don't, I don't know that we are addressing these issues in America because there's not, a, we still, we don't, we still don't have a legal system that protects us. You know, it, it's a legal system that claims to protect us, but it's not a system that actually does. And so until I think, you know, like, un, until I think the infrastructure changes, I think like, not that I think, it's hopeless, but I think we're kind of screwed, you know? And so I think a lot of changes have to be actively made both on an individual and on a community level for whatever rape culture, you know, that is to diminish and dissipate. That was a random. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's take care of him.